Thank you very much. Yeah, so indeed, I changed the title. Um, so, um, and because we've talked a lot about decision focused learning in the seminar so far, but there's also interesting stuff to do without. Actually, we had a bit of both. And so I want to cover also a bit of both here. So, of course, I don't need to introduce what combinatorial optimization is or why it's useful. Um, maybe good to mention at least for a second that indeed, and we have this paradigm if we use our powerful combinatorial optimization solvers, that the idea is that you first formulate the problem in terms of uh, constraints, uh, decision variables, and objective function, and then you use one of these highly efficient generic solvers for routing, scheduling, optimal power flow, and so forth. And so the two big trends uh, in, in, uh, in AI and in this seminar series, of course, is to use machine learning either to learn part of the problem specification or to learn to solve faster. And so I will focus on the left part. Um, that's actually what we do in our lab. So mostly um, ways of using learning to improve the problem specification. And uh, I'm not going to talk about learning the constraints, just want to highlight a bit that this is also a thing. Um, it's actually very symbolic in nature. So it's a structured learning problem. So it's very close to program induction and to symbolic search techniques. Uh, so I put one reference up there. I think it's also super interesting, but, uh, but uh, today uh, I'll talk about where we want to learn part of the coefficients. And so usually these are coefficients of the objective function, uh, but it, it doesn't have to be restricted to that. Although I will only talk about techniques for learning coefficients in the objective function. Um, and then there's a number of terminologies, uh, two of which I used in my title, predict, optimize, decision focused learning. We've heard uh, decision cognizant learning. We've heard differential optimization. So what's in the name? Well, I think for those that have been working already quite some time in this, that this, is, um, this is how we currently use it. So when we talk about prediction plus optimization or predict and optimize, it's typically to describe the problem setting. And so it's super broad, just any kind of problem where you first need to make some prediction and then you need to optimize over it. So it doesn't say anything about the method, just about the type of problem that it is. And then when we use the term decision-focused learning, this is uh, specifically to refer to learning methods that learn based on the error after the optimization. And so I'm not entirely sure about differential optimization. I don't use it myself that much, but I have the impression it's mostly used uh, when people talk about continuous optimization problems. Um, and then it's typically also used in the context of general implicit differentiation methods. And so I think this is one form of doing decision-focused learning. Is there agreement or disagreement on this? Yeah, Paul? So, so can I ask, so I mean, continuous, yeah. you mean like the constraints are smooth functions, let's say, with some curvature or something? Uh, the like, because you can variables. model discrete optimization as an LP, for example, but someone might call an LP a continuous optimization problem. Yeah, and here I call an LP a continuous optimization problem. Yeah, so it, when the decision variables are continuous. OK, OK. Uh, but that's. It's tricky because, like, you could always model, uh, you know, a combinatorial problem as a convex hull of uh, of the uh, uh, the integer solution. So yes, it, it's there's something tricky here. But I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The modeling in that, in that case would not differentiable in any case, right? I mean, you have something that's differentiable still, right? In that case, it's it's a, it's a it's a continuous problem, but it's really not continuous. And also, it seems like there's something um, like differentiable. To guarantee the differentiability, for example, of the uh, optimal solution oracle, I think you need some conditions like curvature of the constraint set or something yes. like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's the last part is a, is a bit less. Yeah. All right. So um, when do we use? So, like from a machine learning point of view, the typical argument is that. You want to do learning, but it's hard to enforce, uh, or it's impossible to enforce hard constraints. So that's when you want to add some reason on top of it. But if you take the optimization, the combinatorial optimization point of view, then the way that we look at it is that in OR in the past, people have almost always assumed that you can, that you can formulate your problem in a formal language easily, or that an optimization can expert can actually formulate it in, as, in terms of constraints over decision variables and objective. And but more and more, and we're in the big data age for quite some time now already. And so I think it's, it's proven that it's not always possible to explicitly model everything in terms of constraints. And then you might want to learn some implicit knowledge from data. So that's the way that we look at this. And so some examples 
of that are in case you work with, uh, with perception. Yeah, so for example, you're working on images and you want to solve some kind of control optimization problem over a representation of that image, an interpretation of that image, or natural language, uh, or even voice and so forth. And so in, in the broader AI community, there's actually a whole trend of what people call neurosymbolic AI, where they typically approach this from symbolic AI techniques rule-based techniques, logic-based techniques, and so forth. And where the idea is, okay, what if you now have part of your problem specification that needs, to, that needs a perception component, eh? that needs, for example, vision, language, and so forth. So I'll talk a little bit about that. I think another exciting area that I won't talk about is what if you're uh, dealing with real people that have user preferences, that have social norms that need to be taken into account when solving combinatorial optimization problems. Think about nurse rostering, think about other kind of problems where this has a lot of impact on the workers and they actually want to have to say something or there's something about their preferences that are taken into account but which are not explicitly written down in rules. And also here, this combination of learning to predict these preferences and optimizing over them uh, is an interesting factor, but I will not cover that uh, today. And then finally, uh, the other use is, is where you're solving computer optimization problems in very complex environments. Uh, for example, where you have demand that needs to be predicted, where you have prices uh, with a lot of uncertainty. We, we saw, again, the energy-based energy, uh, energy -based problems are, are a rich source of problems uh, uh, in this case. And that's typically where decision-focused learning is applied. So I'll talk a bit about the, the top and the bot bottom one here. So um, this, this perception-based solving, for me, it started with this beautiful paper by Wang and Coulter and so forth about SATNET, that's a, a SATNET paper. And there they took images of MNIST digits arranged in a uh, 9 by 9 Sudoku grid. And they asked the question, can we actually, by just observing the image and knowing that they are uh, Sudokus or having a label that are Sudokus or non-Sudokus, can we actually learn what these pairwise Sudoku constraints are? Um, and so that, that paper was really testing the limits of learning for reasoning, about learning these constraints. Well, the constraint structure is fixed, but learning these parameters that can be reinterpreted as constraints. But we look at it uh, from a very different way. Uh, so our way of looking at it is that, well, if you know that it's a Sudoku, constraint solvers, it's like the textbook example of constraint solvers, right? So if you know that it's a Sudoku, just use the constraint specification of Sudoku, right? So you know the constraints, but you still need to get the predictions. And so the, the, the way that it started for us was we wanted to test the limits of what if we're going to do reasoning on top of predictions, on top of things that are learned. And so here's, here's an example. So let's see, let's assume that we have some image we are taken with a camera from a newspaper of a Sudoku. Then we have a neural network. Well, we might cut it into 81 pieces. We have a neural network that predicts for each of the cells um, what, the, uh, what the image uh, represents. And so you, you could take a very standard Lynette architecture, for example, have um, a head that tells you whether it's a number one to nine or whether it's empty. And then you take all of those predictions, and you take the argmax for each of those candidates, you take those predictions, and then you give that to a CP solver. So what would happen if you would do this? And so you can pre-train the neural network uh, up front with some uh, labeled uh, Sudokus. So here's what happens. And so we got a 90, let me use the pointer. And so we get at the, at the image level, so for each individual cell, um, we get an accuracy of about 95%. So this includes both handwritten and printed digits, and there's some lightning effects and so forth, 95. Now, if you give that, that the argmax of each of these cells to the solver, what happens is that in 85% of the time, there will be no answer. There will be an error in one of these 81 cells such that the solver cannot find any solutions. For example, two twos on the same row, which just says, no, I can't. All right, okay. So that's a bit the setup, that's a bit what this naive approach, what, what kind of trouble that you would run into. And actually, uh, this research is from a few years back and we've built this nice uh, demonstrator app called the Sudoku Assistant that you can actually use. It has two parts, and so one part is that you can use your camera, it's available on the Android Google Play Store. You can use your camera, you take a picture of the Sudoku, 
That's what I will talk about now. And then the second part is that it doesn't just solve it and ruin the fun for you, but it will actually explain you what to do if you're stuck. And I'll, I'll shortly highlight that at the very end. But uh, that's this explainable constraint solving another uh, research line. Okay, so let's, I, and we were ha very happy that uh, at uh, AAAI just two weeks ago, uh, this was awarded the best demo award. Um, so pretty proud of that. It was also quite a team effort to go from the research prototypes to an app that my grandmother can use, uh, <laughs> or my mother-in-law actually. All right, so that's uh, so why I, I told you about this problem. So what can we do, or what is, what is happening here? Well, what's happening is that, as I said before, we take the argmax for each of the cells independently, and then the solver finds out that this interpretation yeah, so the argmax interpretation for each of the cells individually is not something that can be completed into a Sudoku. Okay, but what about the next most likely interpretation? Okay, so we don't need to take the argmax for each of the cells. And then the way that we can reformulate this is we can treat this as a joint inference problem, meaning that we can ask... Yes, sorry. Yes? The, the, I mean, the reason why it doesn't uh, complete the, uh, can be... I mean, both the fact that the interpretation is incorrect, but also that somebody did really a mistake, right? Yes, and I will shortly come back to that. Okay. Yeah, so let's assume for now that and it is... An inter a bad interpretation of the machine learning model at the moment. Yes, yeah, but actually the two are very similar. But I will come back to that because they're not entirely similar. But right now the assumption is that it's feasible. Yeah, yes, so right now we assume that this is, that this is or that this should be a valid Sudoku. Uh, even if a mistake was made, there should be an interpretation that is a valid Sudoku. And so we can treat it as a joint inference problem. So instead of doing the argmax for each cell independently, we're looking for an interpretation for each of the cells that together is as likely as possible and that satisfies the rules of the game. Okay, so we're moving the argmax out in a way. Um, and so this is a constraint maximum likelihood interpretation. People have been doing this in natural language processing, for example, where they also get um, uh, predictions of what kind of word type a certain thing is, and then they have grammar rules that determine which ones are valid and not. So this is not something that falls out of the air. Um, can I ask a question? Yes? Does it satisfy the rules of Sudoku? Does it mean like at that particular point, like you don't have two tools at the same row or a column or a square, or does it... Yeah, it's, it's possible it's, to complete the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a completion. So I, I kind of like hit that here, but it means that because this also contains empty cells, right? It means that this interpretation can be in completed. So all of the empty ones can be completed to a Sudoku, to one thing that satisfies all of the rules. But that also means that like directly each of the individual, but also indirectly all of the rules must be lead to a consistent solution. Okay, so this, uh, this looks pretty terrible to give to a constraint solver, but with the standard log likelihood trick, what you get is uh, this uh, nice linear um, objective function over, and for each cell, each possible label, and you get this constant here. Uh, and so you can give that to any constraint solver uh, and it will give you the solution. Um, okay, so before I show some results, Let's now take a look back at what we're doing here. So what we're doing is when we're, we're using the solver to do joint probabilistic inference. But are the values that we're getting from the neural network really probabilistic? And so the solver will trade off and say, this one has a 95% chance of being a five, and a, wait, I should give it a, a 45% chance of being a, um, a five, and a 43% chance of being a two and a 2% chance of being so. And so it will say, okay, instead of taking the 45%, I will take the 43%. And it will trade this off across all of the different cells. And so it's trading off these probability values across these cells. But what we know is that convolutional neural networks are actually prone to, over, to being overconfident. And so this is this result from uh, ICML 2017, where it typically overestimates because of the log loss that is used it overestimates uh, some of the class probabilities and underestimates some of the others. But there exist techniques to overcome this, and so it's called calibration. Um, and so also in this case, what we can actually do is instead of just 
taking the network as this, we can apply some, uh, some scaling, uh, some calibration techniques, and then uh, that actually slightly improves uh, the results that we get. And then we can go back to the solving again. So are we using all available information? I said that there must be a completion to a Sudoku, but these newspaper Sudokus, we actually know that they have to have a unique solution. That's part of the definition of what makes, otherwise people get very frustrated in the newspaper and they have to guess and so forth. And so the, the game says that there has to be a unique solution, but this is not something that you can encode in a constraint solver directly. This is actually a second order constraint, which says that there exists no other completion of the empty cells that is also a solution. So that also satisfies all of the constraints. And so this kind of second order constraints cannot be directly put into the solver, but we can actually have some meta routine around this where if we find um, an interpretation, we check whether there exists another one that fills in the blanks in another way. And if so, we add uh, a cut. I thought I changed this. And so it's a, a no good as we call it. And we, we add a cut that forbids that one and then we find the next most likely interpretation. And so even though this might have seemed like a simple problem initially, there's actually a lot of things that you can continue doing both on the reasoning part and on the prediction part. And so with that in place, as to what we see is that still under the assumption that the input is a valid Sudoku, what we see is that the method corrects uh, almost 5% of the mistakes that the neural network made. And so from a 95% image level accuracy, if we, if we use the technique and we project it back to those digits, we see that we now get a 99.6% uh, accuracy. And then if we do this, uh, this no goods, uh, we get just a tiny little bit more. All right, and so that's what it looks like in the demo. You take a picture, it shows you all of the probabilities and, and people can uh, look around on it. And then if it corrected one of the digits, then it shows you which one it corrected. Yes? Yeah, so the, the image accuracy is on, on, each of the, uh, on each of the individual cells. And then the grid accuracy is whether how many of the, of the instances of where you take all of the 81 by 81 of the entire image, how many of those are accurate? Um, so the, the cell accuracy is the accuracy if the Sudoku is the correct one. So it could be that you get part of the Sudoku of the image right, but not everything. And then that one would be included in the image accuracy because it's got into these 81 pieces, but it would not be counted here. Yeah. Okay, now what about decision-focused learning? As so we, uh, in the next part of the talk, we'll talk about decision-focused learning. So, but we've seen a lot of it in this, in this uh, seminar series already. So could we, instead of learning the network up front, could we actually do decision-focused learning here? And an interesting observation is that the solver actually corrects some of the mistakes that the network is doing. And so if we would then take, the, take a loss function after the solving, then it would not receive any loss or subgradient on those things that it corrected. And so if, if it predicted a five, but the reasoning corrected it to a two, and that one is a solution, it would not get any loss for having predicted a five instead of a two. So that is problematic. And that's what I've been saying for a, a year about now, but given the talks earlier in the seminar, I kind of wondered or realized that there might be a connection to, uh, to these feasibility restoration techniques that Pascal talked about, for example. And in these feasibility restoration techniques, what they do is they actually assume this Lagrangian decomposition, for example, and so they have a separate penalty on constraint violations. So perhaps there could be a way to do it, but then you would need to have this additional term where you penalize constraint violations. So the constraint violations that led to the feasibility being restored. So it could be possible, but this is actually a fully labeled setting. So we're starting from data of Sudokus with the labeling of what each of the cells are. And so in that case, you don't actually need the solver to tell you whether something is wrong or not. You just have the labels. And so, so in, this, in this case where we, have a, where we have accurate labels, I don't think that 
decision-focused learning is necessary. I think it can be done separately. Now, there's a lot of other neurosymbolic techniques where they do not assume that you have a full labeling available. For example, you only have information about whether something is a Sudoku or not. And in that case, at this weak labeling setting, I think decision-focused learning makes sense. But in a strong labeling setting, I don't think it does. Uh, in this classification, and it's also classification, right? Okay, so this is of course a toy problem and a demo, but there's other uh, application settings. For example, when you look at scanned documents, when you look at complex scenes, uh, over which uh, some kind of reasoning or consistency check needs to happen. All right, so that was a bit the warm up. Let's now talk about uh, this end to end uh, training uh, in complex environments. And so, the example that I typically give is when you have uh, historic data on electricity prices for each of the coming 24 hours, and then you have some energy aware scheduling problem where you need to schedule your tasks at certain time frames, such as to minimize the expected energy cost. And you don't know the real energy cost yet, and that's where this comes in. So other examples, and we're talking to a company in the steel industry, where they want to predict steel defects and then uh, change the, the way that they process uh, these steel products on the fly. Or uh, optimization of money, money transport, for example, so vehicle routing, where you want to predict the amount of coins at each of the clients and then the, change the frequency of, uh, of how often they are visits and so forth. Okay, so this is a regression setting. The previous setting was a classification setting. And so, of course, you can do this also in a two-stage setting where the, the learning is not informed by the solving. Yeah, but then we have these cases uh, that others have seen as well where your network might actually improve the, the, the standard prediction loss, so the mean square error, for example. But then if you look at the, the effect after solving, so the regret of using your predictions instead of the true uh, energy costs, then we see that actually this regret can become worse and worse, even though that, uh, that the neural network thinks it's doing better by predicting these electricity prices. Yeah, so this is an extreme case. It's definitely not always like this, but it can happen. And so that's why we need um, a kind of a, a, a task loss, a decision-focused loss. So the way I also look at it is that the mean square error, it's actually an average over the errors over all of the predictions of your multi-output vector. But we're using the solver also in this case to do joint inference, right? So the solver is taking each of the 24 predictions and is doing that. And so you get a joint error. And then I typically say that you don't know which errors are worse. You don't know which of the components are more important than the other one. We did have a talk yesterday by Hamza, who showed that there exists problems where you can actually determine which of the components are more important and which ones are less important. So I think that was very interesting. So in her case, she only needs to call the solver once or analyze the problem once. Um, but I think in general, in order to know which of the components should be penalized stronger and which one softer, we need to call uh, the solver. And that's the whole motivation behind this. And we, we've, seen, we've seen multiple uh, talks mentioning this already. And so the, the two challenges um, that I think are here, the first one is getting the most attention, how to find suitable loss functions such that when you call your solver and you get an answer from it, you can back propagate over that. But I think another very big uh, challenge is that of scalability. And so uh, people like uh, Priya Donti, they, they, for example, they work with specialized solver for specific cases to speed up. And there's been some uh, other work on using continuous relaxations and, and information on that. Uh, but I, I think there's definitely more that can be done here that can also increase the applicability of, uh, of these methods. Okay. Um, so the, the work of, uh, um, actually he's not on here, so it's uh, Coulter and, um, and Amos about differentiating uh, over a quadratic problem. And so there's uh, work here by indeed uh, Bistra and also Aaron, where they look at the discrete problems, also mixed integer programming problems, for example. And then um, an observation there is that given that there is this work that shows how to differentiate over the KKT conditions of a quadratic program, you can actually apply the same kind of technique for mixed integer programs by taking 
the continuous relaxation, maybe tightening it, it a bit, and then adding this quadratic term. And so I would like to take this opportunity to shortly highlight that you don't have to, if you have a linear problem, you don't actually have to add this quadratic term to it. So if we look at what, uh, what happens, uh, what interior point solvers do, then these interior point solvers, what they actually do is they add this logarithmic barrier. And also this logarithmic barrier, it's twice, well, if you take the second derivative of it is non-zero. And so also this one is actually a valid way of being able to differentiate over the KKT conditions. And it's actually a bit more natural. So the way that interior point solvers work is that they actually can decrease this uh, lambda parameter themselves during solving. So you don't have to set this as a hyperparameter. You just have to stop it before it becomes numerically too small. And so, um, yeah, so just want to highlight that that's a nice thing. We published this at NORIPS uh, 2020. Um, and also, instead of using the KKT conditions, what these interior point solvers do is they actually um, uh, they use the homogeneous self-dual, which is, uh, at least in these solvers, a bit more stable representation. And so you can also do that and get, uh, get gradients from that. Okay. That's not what I really wanted to talk about. <laughs> what I actually want to talk about today is about this other class of problems. And these are solver agnostic um, uh, methods for decision-focused learning. And so this one assumes that you have a quadratic program or that you have a linear program, and then differentiates typically over uh, KKT or HSD. But what's nice about this other class of methods, so either with surrogate losses or by perturbation, is that you, it doesn't matter what kind of solver that you use. It doesn't need to be a mixed integer programming solver. It can also be a constraint solver, that's the kind of uh, things that, that, um, that we typically use. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit about this, and I'll start with uh, the seminal work of Paul, it's the, the SPO plus loss function. Um, and so one part of the paper nicely defines this upper bound on the pessimistic uh, view, um, and proves that this upper bound is convex. And so that's a very nice result. And what's most important here is that there's a very, a very elegant subgradient that comes out of it. And this subgradient is what you can use in gradient descent learning. And so the subgradient uh, looks like this. So you have two times where you take the true optimal solution. So that's the optimal solution given that you know what the cost factor is and given that you know what the electricity prices of each of the 24 hours is, you can know what the true optimal uh, schedule would be. And then you take the predictions, and you have your neural network here, you take the predictions and you slightly perturb those predictions and then you call the solver. And this will give you another solution. And by then taking the difference between those two solutions, that gives you that subgradient. And I think it's super elegant. Also, if you, if you think about, assume that you only have binary variables, what will happen here is that either calling the solver with these perturbed predictions will give you, for one of the Boolean decision variables, exactly the same value, then it's zero. So nothing to backpropagate, fine, it's correct. Or it should be a zero, but it is a one, and then it will give you a minus one, or it should be a one, but it is a zero, and then it gives you a one. And so also a very clear interpretation of what it does. And so the, the two observation here is that on the one hand, it has is, does this perturbation, it's all this convex combination of the true cost uh, and, and, um, and the predicted cost. And I, I'd love to talk some more about that, but in here I actually want to focus on the second part. So what it really does is this subgradient compares the optimal solution to V star to this predicted solution under a slight perturbation. Okay, so now I want to take you on a little thought exercise. So, Knowing that it compares, well, do we agree that it compares V star to this V hat? Do we agree? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and so knowing that it compares the optimal uh, V, so the optimal solution to the solution by using the perturbed predictions, what as a machine learning person, what would the machine learning do if our feasible space would contain just five solutions? So nothing more. What would what would, it, what would you do or what would you tell your students 
in a machine learning course? Could we do something else? Exactly, right? So just five, that means that you have an argmin or an argmax over five labels, let's say. You can treat them as being five classes. Your solver, your predictions will either lead your solver to select one, the right one of those five, or it will choose one of the other four and it will be wrong, okay? So, so that means that and you can indeed backprog over the softmax. You don't actually need to backprog over the combinatorial optimization problem. But what if V is huge? And so these are combinatorial optimization problems. Typically, V is exponential in the number of decision variables. Well, also here, machine learning has already tools developed for this. For example, ImageNet has tens of thousands of uh, classes. In language modeling, they use tens of thousands or even more tokens uh, that they predict over. And so the kind of technique that is used there, where it's an argmax over a super large number of, of classes, and the way you can look at it, is this noise contrastive estimation. And so we can use these techniques also in decision-focused learning. And so the way to do that is that what we can do is we can define a discrete exponential distribution over the solution space. Okay, so what is this exponential distribution? Well, we want this exponential will give us a probability for every possible v, for every possible assignment to the decision variables, given the predicted cost factor. And that consists of just taking the exponent of minus the objective function. Okay, so f is the objective function. And then we divide it by this star. That's a, a standard trick when people uh, build these kind of distributions. So it's like a smoothing parameter. Using tor, you can make your distribution more peaked or you can make it more flattened, and you typically want to make it a bit more peaked um, to get a stronger uh, gradient. So we can define this exponential distribution. It's like the softmax, only that there is this z here, there is this normalization constant, and this z is defined over all possible assignments, or, well, the ones that are not the solution, the ones that are infeasible are irrelevant, so over all possible feasible solutions. And this is really the big issue here. And so z is this normalizing constant, and it's impossible to compute. It would require you to enumerate all possible solutions. If you have five, you can do that, but in, in any other case, you can't. Right? And this is where noise contrastive uh, estimation kicks in. And so you might already know it, but the, the intuition of this noise contrastive estimation, or the intuition of the kind of learning that we want to do if we define this distribution, is that we want to learn the parameters of our neural network, and this small omega here, we want, we want the learning to be such that it assigns a higher probability to the true solution, to V star, than to any other solution uh, in, in, in the feasible space. Okay, so we want it to discriminate the true solution from the other ones. And in noise contrastive estimation, the way that they do is, is they take the ratio the ratio between your positive example, is, that's what they call it, and in this case it will be our optimal, the one solution that we know is optimal, and a subset of negative examples, or so a subset of other feasible solutions. And, um, and so it will maximize the logarithm of this ratio of probabilities. Okay? So that, that's uh, what they do in noise contrast estimation, and the math behind it is really beautiful. And so, by taking this ratio and then the logarithm of that product, what happens is that you push the logarithm down, so your products become nice sums, and this probability, and so it's a, it's a division by normalization constant, so your normalization constant actually is taken out and as a minus in this case and as a positive in this case, right? So your normalization constant is now part of the sum, meaning that you can just they just eliminate themselves. And so even though that we built this exponential distribution and all of the theories on this exponential distribution, what you get is this super smooth formula that is a sum over all of your instances, over all of the negative examples in your set, and that just compares the objective value that you get um, given each of those and the objective value that was given to the optimal solution. Okay, so this is really super elegant and the normalization constant disappeared and this is what you can use. So a negative example is, an, is a solution which is not optimal. 
any feasible solution that is not optimal. Yes. And just do some sampling at the beginning to obtain that. Yes, yes. So assume that indeed we generate some feasible solutions. I will say a bit more at the end. You can just keep track of all of the solutions that you computed and use those as negative examples. Yeah. Sorry. The, yes? The V star is the correct solution on the data, right? And then V star is the solution uh, induced by the model. Is that right? So what is V star exactly? V, v I star? Oh, no, that says VS. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, the, the so VS, this yeah. is any feasible solution any neg in our negative set. So any other feasible solution. And we okay. typically call the solver with the predicted values and look at what solution that gives, and that will be one of the negatives. Okay. And so, I mean, if it's, if it's V star, we don't add it, of course, and, it, and this is zero, all is good. But if it's another one, we add it to this S. And so it will say that, OK, you should have taken V star, but you took this one. Yeah. OK. So what does this noise contrastive estimation do? It's instead of reasoning over the full solution space, and what it now allows us to do is it just retranslates into a pairwise comparison between this true solution and then this subset of solutions. And so, for example, here we have six fictive uh, solutions. That is the objective, yeah, it should have been an F. That is the uh, objective function values that you get. V3 here is the true solution. And so if we look at the difference, then we get, and for everything that is ranked higher, we get these positive values. Everything that's ranked lower is these negative values. And so what noise contrastive estimation does is it takes the sum over all of these differences, uh, and, and then you can automatically differentiate this. So this is. But, but then we still need to plug this in with, in the comparison with the true V star somewhere, right? We started with the fact that. You started the equation with the fact that we're comparing the V star yeah. with the best solution under the estimate. Yes. And then you said instead of just doing the, the hard max, do the soft max, and then from there to all the way here. Uh, but we're not doing the soft max. We're doing the noise contrastive estimation. And then we're doing the noise contrastive yeah, and, this, and that gives us this. This is the loss, literally. So then we are forgetting about the actual V star. The true. No, it's here. Eh? That's right there. It's here. Good. I thought that was that was meant to be the optimal solution with respect to the predictions. No, no, no. V star is always the optimal prediction with respect to the true cost coefficients. But you you compute its objective value according to the predictions. The V star remains the same through all of the iterations. So then, uh, in the V S, mm -hmm. that includes the optimum solution with respect to the predicted coefficients of the model. Yes, it should. So that's, that's, uh, let me jump to that. So if you would only use that one, and then, then in, in a probabilistic uh, estimate um, literature, they call this the map estimation. So you just ask, what is the best scoring one? And, and that's this one here. And you only compare the best scoring one with, uh, with the V star here. Right? So if you would only take the best scoring one and compute that difference, that would be what you do. But noise contrastive estimation says that you use multiple negative solutions. In fact, typically, you need to use uh, a lot to get uh, the most stable result. And so in NCE, you would take all of these set of feasible solutions that you have, not just a map. But as we show in the paper, and so this is uh, HK21, you can also use the map. Uh, at mathematically, you can also. Now, there's one little detail. <laughs> And that is that if you have this formula, and let's take it for the map, and again, I, the O should be Fs, but the rest is the same, then this is actually, it's a linear objective function, and it means that you can rewrite it as being your predicted cost factor times the true, this one should not have a star, the true solution minus your, the one that you get, right? And so what's tricky here is that your neural network can trivially minimize it by setting this one to zero. And so what you need to do, you need to add a perturbation. In retrospect, this should have been 2c hat minus c, which is exactly the perturbation that was proposed in SPO. OK, uh, well, we, in, in the paper, we use c hat minus c, but uh, you, can, you can use any kind of perturbation, and then that will avoid, uh, that, will avoid that. OK, so this can also be applied to L, the laws of NCE. 
Okay, so that's, that's really um, the idea here, but as you may have noticed when I was explaining it, I was telling you that everything that ranks higher than the true solution has a positive, um, gets a positive weight. And so after this paper, we were wondering, there's something very rank, learning to rank flavorish to this. And so, so we, uh, we thought some more about that. And I think, so th this NCE, the intuition behind it is that you should give a higher probability to V star than to any other V as in S. And so we then looked into learn, a learning to rank interpretation of this. So this is ICML 2022. And the, the key observation uh, behind that paper is that if you look at what the objective function does, and so the objective function is this linear function with these predicted coefficients, then an objective function induces a ranking over the feasible solutions. And so if you have your true costs, then this, for example, would be the ranking. And if you have your predicted costs, and so you would get slightly different values for each of these, and that would induce a different kind of ranking. So it's actually a natural way to look at it. So your objective function, the true one or the one you're trying to learn, induces this kind of ranking. So can we use ranking-based losses? So the thing is that in this case, there's again an exponential number of feasible solutions, right? So it's a ranking over an exponent. It's an implicit ranking in most cases. So what do they do in the learning to rank literature? In the learning to rank literature, they typically assume that for every query, as it is called, for every instance, there is um, a limited set of relevant, uh, of relevant uh, solutions, uh, relevant documents in their case. So in this, in this work, in making a connection to learning to rank, we have to assume that there is a subset of feasible solutions S. So you already feel some similarity to the previous one, but it's, a, it's a, still a different way of looking at it. So let's assume that you have a subset of feasible S, that's the, the relevant documents for that query. Then we can actually use these techniques from learning to rank and the loss functions uh, um, that have been studied there. And so in learning to rank, people typically talk about a pointwise loss, so where you, you have a loss function that just looks at every one of the documents independently, a pairwise loss that compares the pairs, or a listwise loss that does it over the entire list um, of solutions. So what does that mean for each of the three cases? How do we reinterpret that uh, for decision-focused learning? So a pointwise loss would be that we would, for every one of our feasible solutions in this set, including the true one, we would actually do a regression between what the predicted objective function is, um, so the objective function with the predicted values, uh, costs, and the true objective function value. And so you would do some kind of standard regression loss function, like mean square error over those two, and that's what you would get. So that's, that's what the learning to rank literature says would be a valid decision-focused learning loss function. And it's indeed a valid one, uh, just not a very strong one, but you can do that and, and it will give you some results. So a second type of typical loss function for learning to rank is pairwise loss function. And so um, the way that we formulate it here is that, uh, so pairwise means between what you know should be the best document, uh, what we know is the optimal solution and the other feasible solutions in our set. So it actually looks very similar to the, to the map and CE loss that we saw before. This was the map and CE loss from our few slides back. And so in, in learning to rank, and it has, a, it has connections to a structured prediction and the structured perceptron and so forth. And so there it's, it's common to use like an additional margin parameter that says that the two needs to be separated uh, a, a little bit more. And so if you, if you take that route, this would be a very natural loss function that you get uh, um, from that. And so it's highly related, but it has this additional um, margin separator. And then the list-wise, I think this is obviously is the strongest one in the literature, and it's also the most interesting one here. So how, what, what happens, or like what do they do, or how can we apply these ideas uh, from a list-wise learning to rank function to decision-focused learning? Interestingly, what you do, or what you have to do, is you introduce an exponential distribution, exactly the same exponential distribution as in, as in uh, uh, noise contrastive estimation, right? So it's exactly the same distribution with one little difference, and that is that in learning to rank, 
they assume that you have a finite set of relevant documents. So in lowering to rank, the normalization constant is not this unreachable normalization constant over all possible solutions, but it is the normalization constant over your finite subset of solutions. So you have a finite sample of solutions, so you compute, you can compute this z prime. And you, let's say that there's 100 or 1,000 or even 10,000, you, you can just compute them and get that value. And when you get that value, that means that for each of these feasible solutions, you can compute their value, and so you get an empirical distribution induced by the cost coefficients. So you get one empirical distribution if you compute this for your 1,000 uh, feasible solutions using the true cost factor, and you get another one if you do this for, uh, with your predicted costs. And so for each of those 1,000 ones, you get a value, and now, the nicest thing is that once you have these empirical distributions, you can use any kind of standard loss over them. And so you could use a log loss, or you can use this uh, well-known kullback leibler divergence between these two distributions. Okay, so that maps really well. Um, it also works well. And so this is a, a, one of the comparisons in there. Yeah, so many of the techniques uh, perform equally well, and there's quite some variance in these results, but so they definitely work equally well than SPO and then some of, uh, of, the, of the other techniques, uh, for example. And it's also quite stable. So where do the feasible solutions come from? That was one of the questions. I've shown you before that you call the solver and then you back propagate over the loss. So what, what we change, tiny change, and we, we get the predictions, we call the solver, and then we add the answer into this cache of feasible solutions, and so we just store them, and then that cache are our negative examples in the NCE case, or is our, our finite set of documents in the ranking case, and from that we can then use either standard NCE loss or standard ranking losses and backpropagate over that, right? So we're no longer trying to backpropagate directly over the solver, but we use the answer of the solver, any kind of solver, to get this cache, and then the, the loss function is defined over that cache. Do you have any insight about how this uh, set of feasible solutions might influence the gradients you get? Have you guys done any kind of ablation or um, study on sensitivity? I, uh, yes, but in a positive way, and I will get to that. You can just sometimes Cut, shortcut here, and, okay. So, what happens is that you're doing gradient descent, so you're doing small changes to your, to your network parameters, and especially later in your iterations, that means also small updates to the cost coefficients. So what we see is that in many cases, especially in the later iterations, you call the solver, and it's giving you a solution that is already in the cache. And so your concern is, what if there is too little in the cache? But our observation was, actually, even when you use SPO, in many cases, you, you get a solution that was already previously found. So that will be, I will come to that in a, in a second. Um, so in, in SPO, for example, you just call the solver every time, and it adds this map solution, and you can do that here as well, and it should be as good. I was just wondering, especially in the beginning, when it makes most difference, like if you, if you could have several different strategies of getting this initial cache of feasible solutions. Are some, some strategies better than other yes. jump strategies? That's an open question. I, 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 we're, we want to know more from the perspective of saving computations. Yeah. So the V star, you need to know the V star, right? So before decision-focused learning starts, you compute all of your V stars, on the, and that's the initial cache. Okay. And that's a super strong cache already. And so from the very first backprop that you do, you're not, you're not just using v star, one V star and one map, you're using all of the V stars as the feasible solutions. So, uh, so it works well and uh, it's pretty robust. So let now get to the point of, of that. So I said that the second key bottleneck is that we have to repeatedly call the solver and then um, so how much, how am I doing on town? You are doing uh, I should good. So you are 
still. Uh, no, actually, you're not. I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But, yeah. but it's okay. Don't worry about that. We are interrupted with a lot of questions. Yes. <laughs> yeah, how, much, uh, how much do you need? <laughs> uh, I think five to ten. Ah, yeah, so it's until now. That's what I, that's what I feared. So this, I'm definitely. At the, at the I mean, with questions, we'll be until 11.15. Yeah. 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 So we that's really good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. so you can keep going because okay. the questions have been already in the Yes, time. yes. Okay, all right. So as, as, I, as I explained uh, two slides too early, but <laughs> I'm happy to, is that what we observed was that in many cases, we get an answer from the solver that is already in the cache. And this creates an opportunity that we can actually sometimes skip the solver and just go directly to the cache and use that cache. And so we only tried the simplest of simplest things. I think there's a lot to do here. But what we did was we just had this sampling parameter and you say, you just randomly choose whether to call the solver or only use the cache. And what we saw is that even if you call the solver only 5% of the time, and so 95 for 95% of the instances, you're going to skip straight through. But of course, all of the V stars are in here. Eh? So 95% of the time during training, you're going to skip. Then you still get decent results and you're saving 95% of the time because almost all of the time uh, of the learning goes into here, right? And so I think the, the, the nice thing about this is that it works with any black box uh, decision-focused learning loss function. And so it works with SPO as well. Just, you, you can skip it and then, and so some uh, experimental results. So there's this other perturbation technique from uh, Poganchik called black box. So, I mean, it has a number of names, but Black box, so it, this one actually requires you to call the solver twice. You, you perturb your predictions, even the true predictions, you call the solver, you perturb your predictions, and then you call the solver again, and then you compare that. So it has two solver calls for every instance uh, at every epoch. Um, and so if we use this solution caching technique here, so the original one without the solution caching is this blue line, and so it takes uh, up to a thousand seconds to converge. And then if we do this solution caching, so all of this initial time is computing the V stars, and then it, it goes like so much more. This is at a 5%, uh, actually 10% apparently, 10% uh, uh, cache rate. So 10% of the, only 10% of the time do we call the solver. And so also SPO is in here. And so this is, if you don't do the caching and it, it's, it stays at the same level, so the, act, the quality stays at the same level, just the runtime jumps to the front. And so we're pretty excited about this. So this was actually already in HKI paper, but also in the learning to rank paper at ICML. And, uh, and there's many more to do about what is a good caching scheme, what is a good initialization, uh, and so forth. So maybe on the technical side, a final point of view, why does this make sense? So if we look at uh, these, uh, con a lot of the white box methods, so. Uh, and what they do is they take the continuous approximation and they take the LP, for example, also for SPO, you can take the LP um, uh, to make it faster. So they, they have this concept of a continuous approximation. And if you look at the polytope, if it would be a MIP that you would get, so the continuous relaxation is like an outer approximation of the feasible space. And when we store this, this, um, this solution cache, when we store each of the, of the solutions that are found, you can see this as an inner approximation. So it only sees uh, these integer points that have been for one of the coefficient vectors that have been optimal. So if you, uh, so if you believe that continuous approximations are valid, then you should also realize that, that, this, that using this cache is also valid and that it's, uh, that it's an inner approximation and it's actually a very efficient one. So you don't even need to solve the LP, you can just do a linear pass over your table uh, uh, to get the solution. Yes? There's some value then to, during the, the first step to try to create the, as diverse cache or widespread cache as possible. Uh, tons of like the right question, no answer yet. Yeah. So th this is really cool. So then can you use the inner and outer approximation to get, for example, a bound on the approximation quality to SBO plus? Like, uh, could you use the fact that you have both inner and outer approximation huh. to get a bound? Yeah. That would be cool. Yeah. Well, they, they skipped the outer altogether. 
Yeah, we don't use so the, the outer. Give you the upper bound, and then the inner gives yeah. you the lower bound. That's right? interesting. Yeah. If you're willing to pay the price to the outer, that, yeah. that would be very interesting. Yeah, yes. that would be cool. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I skipped, it's easy, super easy to implement, as is the original SPO and, and many of the other uh, black box methods. Um, voila, and so that's, I shared a bit the way that we look at it, like explicit knowledge versus implicit knowledge. Typically it all comes down to using a solver for joint inference. Um, the standard ML toolkit, L ranking and CE and support already has a lot of powerful losses that, that we think are, are of interest here and relevant here. Um, and then it's actually possible to scale this up using this, uh, this solution cache. Okay, so what's the bigger picture? I'll just race you through it very quickly. And so in standard ways we have a user and the user constraint solver. And now what we're doing is, can we actually learn part of the problem specification either from the user, I didn't talk about that, or from the environment. But in our, in like my grant research program, like this is not where we want to stop. We actually want to continue from that. And we also not just learn from the user, but also would like to develop techniques where users can learn from the system. So having more explainable constraint solving, and then ideally have some kind of stateful interaction around that. And so this, this is a Sudoku app uh, that we that we developed, it doesn't just contain the, the learning part, but it also has an example of what these explanations could look like. So you can tell it to give you a hint, and then it will highlight precisely the minimal amount of information needed to find a next step. And so it will tell you, it doesn't tell you which, which cell you've missed, but it, it highlights, okay, if you use these and these, and these constraints, you as a user can find out what the value is there. So this is part of a big, five years, two million ERC grant uh, that I received. And so it's quite conversational in our technology for optimization. And we're also developing solver agnostic libraries, so constrained programming languages, modeling languages, that make it easy to integrate to machine learning libraries, that you can do repeated solving, super important in decision-focused learning and in these explanation techniques. And as I said, we on, don't only use MIP, we also use many other techniques, and that's what's allowed there. And then finally, some advertisement, entirely within, within line of this, uh, this workshop series. In the summer in Leuven, we will organize the ACP Summer School on Machine Learning for Constrained Programming. We're still assembling the speaker list, including some here in the room, but uh, I, I can recommend it. It's not LA weather, although the picture seems to uh, imply that, but uh, it, it is a, a nice city in, uh, in Europe, and, and it's gonna be a great program. So, Thank you very much. I'll uh, I'll wrap up. Thank you.